Okay, this is VOA One the Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Ashley and I will bring you stories along with Van Novak. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Dan Novak. American officials say they are concerned at how quickly China is strengthening its military power in a wide range of areas. The officials say China is continuing to build up its nuclear weapons program, along with its space, cyber, and missile technologies. Air Force General John Hayden. Is the number two ranking U.S. military official? He told the Associated Press that he finds the rate at which China is moving stunning. The growth comes as China's government has increased its military activities around Taiwan, which Beijing considers a rebel territory. China has said it plans to one day reclaim the territory and would use force if necessary. China's military expansion is seen as an effort to change a world balance of power that has long favored the United States. If China becomes more powerful, that may not be a direct threat to the U.S., but it could change American alliances in Asia. New signs of how Washington deals with China may come out in the coming weeks as Joe Biden's administration. Reviews its defense policy. The latest example of China's fast growth was the country's recent test of a hypersonic weapon. The weapon is able to partly orbit Earth before re-entering the atmosphere and heading toward a target. General Mark Milley is chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the highest-ranking U.S. military official. He called the test very concerning for the United States. Milley said the hypersonic weapon test was very close to being what he called a Sputnik moment. He was speaking about an event in 1957, in which the Soviet Union surprised the world by launching the world's first space satellite. The event led to a nuclear arms and space race. Between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but Milley added that the problems presented by China's military modernization go much further. That's just one weapon system, he recently told Bloomberg Television. The Chinese military capabilities are much greater than that. Satellite images in recent months have also shown that China has built more launch silos. For its nuclear missiles, an important driver of China's growth in nuclear weapons is its concerns about possible U.S. actions, says Fiona Cunningham. She is a professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. She told the AP, she thinks China's nuclear growth could limit the effectiveness. Of a possible first U.S. strike against Chinese weapons, some defense experts are concerned that the U.S. will enter into an arms race with Beijing, as it has been unable to bring the Chinese government into security talks. Congress is also increasingly centered on China, and supports more financing for space and cyber operations. And hypersonic technologies. For now, Russia is seen as a larger threat to the U.S. than China because it has many more nuclear weapons. But Milley and others say China is a bigger long-term worry because it is much stronger economically than Russia. 
General Hayton noted that China will overtake both Russia and the U.S. in overall military power in the coming years if we don't do something to change it. Senior U.S. military officials have also been warning this year that China is working to capture Taiwan. Foreign policy experts see the independent island as a possible trigger for a U.S.-China war. While the United States has long promised to help Taiwan defend itself, it is unclear how far it would go to answer a Chinese attack. Last month, President Joe Biden said America would come to Taiwan's defense if it were attacked by China. We have a commitment to do that, Biden said. The White House later said this does not represent a change in U.S. policy. The current policy is that the U.S. does not support Taiwanese independence, but will provide defensive arms. I'm Dan Novak. Indians began celebrating Diwali, the Hindu festival of lights, on Thursday. The celebration comes as the country is still dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, as well as rising air pollution. Diwali is usually celebrated by socializing and exchanging gifts with family and friends. Many light oil lamps or candles as a sign of the victory of light over darkness. Many people also set off fireworks as part of the celebrations. Last year, the celebrations were limited following a sharp increase of COVID-19 infections. The celebrations seem to be returning this year even though the government has asked people to avoid large gatherings. In the northern city of Ayodhya in Uttar Pradesh state, people lit over 900,000 lamps and kept them burning for 45 minutes on Wednesday. Last year, the city lit about 600,000 lamps. Along the Saryu River, Thousands of visitors ignored coronavirus social distancing restrictions to watch the lights. People lit up their houses and temples as lasers and fireworks brightened the city's streets. The festival is being celebrated at a time when India's pandemic crisis has largely decreased. On Thursday, the country recorded over 12,000 new coronavirus cases and 461 deaths. Earlier this year, India recorded a few hundred thousand new infections every day. The health ministry reported more than 35 million infections and over 459,000 deaths in the country so far. Last month, India injected its one billionth COVID-19 vaccine, giving hope that life is returning to normal. More good news came Wednesday when the World Health Organization approved India's homegrown Covaxin vaccine for emergency use. Imagine you are learning about a science. Perhaps you want to read a science book, science news, or scientific research in English. There are certain structures that are common to all of these kinds of writing. In today's Everyday Grammar, we will explore the connection between science writing and modifiers, 
a word or group of words that describes another word or group of words. Let's start with a few important terms and ideas. In grammar, the word modifier includes several groups of terms: adjectives, participles, prepositional phrases, appositives, and more. Modifiers can appear before or after a noun. A noun and its modifiers can create a noun phrase, a group of words that acts like a noun in a sentence. Let's consider an example. You might read about an interesting study. The words "an interesting study" make up a noun phrase. The word "an" shows the beginning of the noun phrase. The modifier is interesting. It is an adjective that comes before the noun "study." Modifiers can also come after a noun. Imagine you read a science story that says something like this: Scientists found evidence of a large black hole. In the example, the noun "evidence" is followed by a kind of modifier known as a prepositional phrase. The words "of a large black hole." In speaking. Noun phrases commonly only have a noun, pronoun, or noun and determiner. A word such as the, this, a, and so on. So you might hear someone say, "I called my friend." In the example, the noun phrase is "my friend." It has the noun, friend, and the determiner. My. In writing, noun phrases are more likely to have modifiers that come before and after the noun. These modifiers are often more complex than what you hear in everyday speaking. Let's explore some science stories that have appeared recently on VOA Learning English's website. You will see that modifiers play an important part. In giving information about scientific studies, for example, here is one story that reports findings from a study. The study used a high-tech sensing device known as lidar. A careful study of a large area in Mexico has found hundreds of ancient ceremonial centers. The important noun is the word study. It forms the base of the sentence's subject. If the modifiers were taken out of the first part of the sentence, it would be this: A study has found hundreds of ancient ceremonial centers. Note that the sentence is still complete. Some of the details have been removed, but the sentence still has the elements of a complete sentence: subject, verb. Object. Note that the modifiers in the original report come both before and after nouns. A careful study of a large area in Mexico. The adjective "careful" comes before the noun "study." The phrase "of a large area" comes after "study," and the phrase "in Mexico" comes after the noun "area." Let's see how modifiers play an important part in another science story. Astronomers say they have found evidence for the first time of a planet orbiting a star outside our Milky Way galaxy. Notice here that the subject of the sentence is very short. Astronomers, but modifiers play an important part. In the sentence's predicate, the noun "evidence" is followed by the modifier for the first time, which is in turn followed by more modifiers of a planet, and so on. 
One way to think about the central idea of today's report is to imagine a skeleton, the bones that make up the basic structure of a person or animal. On top of the basic structure, there are increasing levels of complexity that create a living being. Fat, nerves, muscles, blood vessels, and so on. In grammar, we have a basic structure that makes up the central meaning of a sentence. Subject and predicate, noun or noun phrase and verb. Modifiers add weight or detail to the basic structure. The modifiers bring sentences to life. The next time you are reading science news, scientific research, or really any kind of writing in English, pay careful attention to how the writer uses modifiers. Identify the basic structure of a sentence and then make note of how modifiers play a part in it. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In any war, the enemy's capital city is an important target. To capture the enemy's capital usually means victory. In the American Civil War, the North hoped for a quick victory by capturing the southern capital at Richmond, Virginia. Northern forces were strong enough. There were about 150,000 Union soldiers in and around Washington. General George McClellan led this Army of the Potomac. It was the biggest, best trained, and best equipped of the Union armies. Larry West and Tony Riggs report on McClellan's move against Richmond. For the first year of the Civil War, the Army of the Potomac did not fight. General McClellan kept making excuses for his failure to act. He had a plan, he said, and he would not move until he was sure his men were ready. McClellan's plan was to put his army on boats in the Potomac River. They would sail down the river to where it emptied into the Chesapeake Bay. Then he would land the boats on the coast of Virginia, east of Richmond. President Abraham Lincoln wanted to capture the Confederate capital. But he did not like the idea of moving all of McClellan's men. That would leave the city of Washington without protection. McClellan tried to calm Lincoln's fears. He said that as soon as he marched toward Richmond, any Confederate soldiers near Washington would withdraw they would be needed to defend their own capital. The Army of the Potomac began to move on March 17, 1862. Within two weeks, more than 50,000 had reached Fort Monroe, southeast of Richmond. They were equipped with 100 big guns and tons of supplies. Day by day, the Union force at Fort Monroe grew larger. McClellan had planned to move quickly to Yorktown, then push on to Richmond. He would move along the finger of land between the York River and the James River. He soon learned, however, that he could not move as quickly as planned. Heavy spring rains had turned the dirt roads into rivers of mud. 
McClellan's men could push through, but there was no way they could bring their big guns. McClellan decided to wait. He did not want to attack Yorktown without artillery. President Lincoln was not pleased. He sent a message to McClellan. You must strike a blow, Lincoln said. You must act. But still, McClellan delayed. By the time his artillery had arrived and was in place, Confederate troops had withdrawn. They moved to the woods outside Williamsburg. McClellan chased them. For the first time, his army went into battle. The fighting was strange. The woods were so thick that the two sides could not often see each other. Soldiers fired at the flash of gunpowder, at noises, anything that moved. Their aim was good enough. About 4,000 soldiers were killed. In his reports to Washington, McClellan claimed great victories at Yorktown and Williamsburg. Yet he was worried. He believed the Confederate force around Richmond was much larger than his. He demanded more men. The Confederate force was, in fact, much smaller than the Union force. But it was deployed in a way to make it seem much larger. The trick fooled McClellan. By the middle of May, 1862, his army was only 15 kilometers from Richmond. Still, he did not attack. He continued to wait for more men and equipment. Confederate President Jefferson Davis was worried. He knew the Confederate Army was smaller than the Union Army. Davis's military advisor, General Robert E. Lee, offered a plan. Lee proposed that General Stonewall Jackson lead his army up Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. The North would see the move as a threat to Washington. Union troops would be kept near Washington instead of being sent to Richmond. President Davis agreed. Orders were sent to Jackson. Stonewall Jackson was one of the South's best generals. He was a forceful leader, and he could make his men march until they dropped. He got the name Stonewall at the Battle of Bull Run in the summer of 1861. Southern soldiers were withdrawing. A Confederate officer tried to stop them. He urged them to follow Jackson's example, to stand and fight. He shouted, There stands Jackson, like a stone wall. General Jackson faced three large Union forces in and around the Shenandoah Valley. Yet he struck hard and fast, and soon had control of the valley's main towns. His campaign is still studied at military schools around the world. It is considered an excellent example of how to move troops quickly to where they are most needed. Jackson's raids produced the exact effect Robert E. Lee had wanted. Everyone in Washington feared an immediate attack on the city. Soldiers were hurried to the capital from Baltimore and other nearby cities. 
and President Lincoln sent thousands of troops to chase Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley instead of helping McClellan at Richmond. The Union Army outside Richmond was deployed on either side of the Chickahominy River. The Chickahominy was not a big river. It could be crossed easily at several places. While McClellan waited to attack the Confederate capital, heavy rains began to fall. The little river began to rise. The commander of Confederate forces in Richmond saw this as a chance to smash a large part of McClellan's army. The flooding river would soon cut the Union force completely in two. When that happened, the Confederates would attack. They expected to destroy at least half of McClellan's army. The plan seemed good, and after the first few hours of battle, the Confederates were close to victory. But one bridge remained over the Chickahominy River. Union soldiers were able to cross it. The Confederates were forced to withdraw to their earlier positions. No ground was gained, and more than 11,000 men were killed or wounded. Among the wounded was the commander of all Confederate forces, General Joe Johnston. General Robert E. Lee would take his place. Lee wasted no time. He wanted to push the Union Army far away from Richmond. First, however, he wanted more information about his enemy. He sent a young officer, Jeb Stuart, to get it. Stuart set off with more than a thousand men on horseback. Theirs was a wild ride around the edge of the Union Army. When they reported back three days later, General Lee knew exactly where he would attack. It would be the first in a series of battles known as the Seven Days Campaign. Lee took a big chance. He moved most of his men into position to attack what he now knew was the weak right side of the Union line. He left only a few thousand men to defend Richmond. He hoped the Union commander, McClellan, would be fooled by this plan. For if McClellan discovered how few men were left behind, he could smash through easily and capture the city. With the help of Stonewall Jackson's army, Lee's plan worked. McClellan was fooled. And after a day of fierce fighting, he was forced to withdraw from the area. Lee chased McClellan for a while. They clashed at such places as Mechanicsville, White Oak Swamp, and finally Malvern Hill. The South won the Seven Days Campaign. The threat to Richmond was ended. The Confederacy was saved. But victory came at a terrible price. 20,000 Confederate soldiers were killed or wounded. As both the North and South were learning quickly, the Civil War was becoming more costly than anyone had imagined. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.